the EP podcast. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found, and always at the eppodcast.com. Sit down here at the nine foot homemade oak bar. What a treat! Uh, it's not often that we get a U.S. congressman down here. We've had some that were running for office, but they lost. So this is our first winner. Sean Caston's here. How are you? I'm um, doing well. Always a pleasure to be in somebody's somebody's random basement. <laughs> <laughs> How much convincing does it take for somebody to come to you and say, look, I, I know that you're in the, one of the higher seats in government. Uh, you're, you're one of the few that are, are, are pushing national things and making massive decisions. But there's a guy in Evergreen Park who's got a podcast in his basement. And they'd like you to come on and talk a little bit about Evergreen Park. Like, that had to take a little convincing. It, well, honestly, as we said before we went on the air here, when Kelly Burke recommended, that was all That was all it took. <laughs> Kelly's a wonderful person, great mayor in Evergreen Park, and uh, um, that was the reference check we needed. Yeah, she's the best. Uh, so, as you can hear, Sean Caston is on this episode sitting here with me right now. Later on in the show, big party coming along 95th Street, coming up very quickly, live band most Holy Redeemer throws a few big bashes each year. The folks behind it are down here to invite all of you to the big party. Everything you hear on this episode is brought to you by the First National Bank of Evergreen Park. They invest in the EP community. After all, they love this area as much as you do. Their total access checking account gives you free ATMs nationwide. No matter where you use an ATM, no matter what the fee on the ATM is, they're going to put the money back in the bank. So that makes the ATM free. They got brand new mobile banking tools. You can do everything quickly with the touch of a button on your phone. And there's no overdraft fees. And that's just one of the accounts they have. So many different ones set up for different people in the family. My daughter has one set up that's going to make it really easy when she goes off to college in a couple of months for me to get her money. And still gives her all of the perks I just mentioned. Get over to 95th and Pulaski, that big iconic building right there on the corner, the First National Bank of Evergreen Park, member FDIC. I, w- I was thinking about, well, what can I ask you about that's Evergreen Park centric? And there are a few things that it probably takes the weight of a congressman. Probably, it probably takes the weight of, a, of a, a U.S. representative, somebody who's got a little bit more on the federal level to deal with some of the stuff that people complain about all the time here in Evergreen Park. And one of the big things they all complain about is they complain about the trains. They complain about the fact that, like, we have we have a train that runs right through the center of the village. It runs right next to the police station. It cuts off the fire station from one side to the other. It crisscrosses, so it goes across 95th, and it goes across Kedzie about 200 feet from the intersection of 95th and Kedzie. So it can literally take the entire village and bring it to a standstill. And it's something that you see on social media here in Evergreen. There's Facebook pages. I'm sure you stay off of those things because, (laughs) you know, they they, they will get crazy, but people get on, they voice it, they're upset. And it's one of the big complaints. Now, I worked Cook County 911, I was telling you that. And for a while, we were dispatching Metra police as part of the police stations we were doing. So I learned a lot about trains. And I understand it is very difficult to get trains and the companies that run, especially these freight lines, to make any changes whatsoever. What has that been like so far? Because I know it's a complaint you've heard, and I know it's something you're working on. Um, yeah, so uh, a little bit of background. So I grew up in the, on the East Coast, moved to Chicago in 2007. Most of what I knew about Chicago before I came out here was from the Blues Brothers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I, and I feel like every time I'm around, I, I always think of that scene where I said, do the trains come by often? So, so often you hardly notice them. <laughs> like, <laughs> And, you know, and that's that's like, you know, our ability to do things at the federal level. You know, yes, we've steered, you know, money into rail grade separations and, you know, up in up in Barrington. We got a project in Glen Ellen right now and we can steer money around like that. But but a lot of the biggest sort of looking at the big sort of what's going on overall nationally. And I, I think people know this. It always surprises me when I'm back home. Chicago is the third biggest intermodal hub in the world. The number one is Singapore. The number two is Hong Kong. Number three is Chicago. So the other two you might notice are are islands on the ocean where huge amounts of container ships are coming in. In Chicago, it's all coming in. And so it's not just the rail, but all the trucks that are coming in and pulling this through. I had, uh, when we were working on the the infrastructure bill, um, 
I met with Secretary Buttigieg and <clears throat> I sort of joked with him. I said, you know, you get these meetings with every member of Congress and they all tell you that their district is the most important district in the country for infrastructure investments. And I have good news. I'm the only one who's not lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, you know, it's because true. Like, if you don't, if you don't de-bottleneck the rail in Chicago, you can't move goods around the country. And, you know, the city was was built on rail, but we've not kept up on the infrastructure side. And so, yes, we can, you know, we can work on things. We can lean on people. We can, you know, try to use whatever our, you know, bully pulpit is. But at the end of the day, we just got to get money into infrastructure. And so, you know, in that infrastructure bill, I think there's, if my memory is right, about $60 billion that's specifically targeted to Illinois. There's another $16 billion um, that can go through. You're seeing some of those dollars start to flow with the CREATE project, some of the money around Metra. Um, I think about $11 billion of that has flowed so far. If I'm really honest, that's probably nowhere near enough. Like, I still don't think Illinois is getting as much. We're, we're getting our fair share as a state. I think that when but in I terms of our the, contribution yeah. to like rail, you know, and that infrastructure, I think we should be getting a lot more of that. But be careful what you wish for, right? St. Louis doesn't have a problem with rail. They also don't have a lot of people who live in St. Louis anymore. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> right? the thing is, like, I, I hear those numbers. And as somebody who's a voter and somebody kind of pays attention to everything going on, I go, OK, well, yeah. I always hear these big numbers, but how much of it actually gets to where it needs to go? Like, how how much how do you make sure that it's making a real impact? Because like the first there's two things that I think of right away when I think of the rail problem. I think one, there's got to be a little bit better communication or even penalty to the companies. I know that they run make the country run. I know they're important, but there's got to be something that says, hey, you can't park the train for an hour in the middle of the South side. And it's not just evergreen, it's everywhere. So somebody has got to come down a little bit on it, but two, you, you have, you have so many technological advancements. I have a, a, a nine-year-old who loves trains. He goes on prime and he shows me like all the newest trains around the world that move quicker, can stop and start quicker so they can get through an area quicker. Is that the kind of thing that we're going to see these billions of dollars spent on? Is there going to be what, what kind of change has, has been discussed that might actually make things run smoother? Well, so I think I think a part of what we need is, you know, we've got, and you had alluded to this in the trains, we built the railroad system in America 150 years ago by giving railroad companies monopoly rights on that train ride. And we've never really undone that. You know, I mean, we, you probably know this, but I think it's worth reminding when you, you know, when you ride the Metro and you say, I'm on the BNSF line or I'm on the UP line, there's a reason why that's the name of the railroad. Right, because it's theirs. They own because it. They own it. Yeah. And they are the ones, you know, Amtrak has to ask them for permission to use their track. Um, Metro, and, you know, and, and I'm overstating a little bit. There's coordination. There are groups that tie these things together. But there is no, there's no equivalent of like the Federal Highway Department who is who is deciding who can use the roads and how they use it. They're, they're owned by the rail yards. And... So ultimately, like, I think what we have to do to fix that is we really need to build more rail. We've got to deal with some NIMBY issues. I think particularly here in like on the south side of Cook, there's a lot less because, you know, I, I represent DuPage and, and Southwest Cook. There's a lot less flexible rail down in Southwest Cook than there is in DuPage. You know, so in DuPage, where I live in Downers Grove, there's there's trains, you know, during rush hour every 20, 30 minutes um, coming downtown. Yeah. Um, if you're in Oak Lawn. You know, you might be waiting an hour. Um, yeah, the old one stop not gets because, one metro at a time, but that's because the freight lines need so much room. Well, it's 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 a little bit twofold. Number one, there's a lot of freight. We've got plenty of freight going out on that BNSF line yeah. through, through Downers Grove as well. But the that community was built out not necessarily around the rail as a commuter resource. It was built out around the rail as a as a as a freight nuisance. So it's hard to like you've, you've now got like people living and commuting. And it's not very conducive to get it on the rail line. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to build new high-speed corridors that are dedicated to passenger rail. I think the high-profile ones are on the East Coast. There's talk of doing a Chicago to St. Louis one. Those are those are big, long-term projects. Um, but, uh, you know, Daniel Burnham, make no small plans, right? There you go. <laughs> right? There you go. But as long as we're, we're sharing that one track with the freight system, with the metro system, with the with Amtrak, no one's going to be happy. Uh, and I would I would add, combined to that... The, the the belt yard, you know, just up here, it comes through Bedford Park in that area. 
I think the numbers are 30% of all freight rail cars in America spend at least 24 hours of every year in that yard. So like there is no such thing as a freight car that isn't at some point assembled and disassembled in that yard. Well, that's those big long ones that come through, right? And so now you've, now how do you get that through? Because once that train gets clearance to move, you probably don't want it moving through at 50 miles an hour. Right. And it but takes a while for it to ramp it's up and slow down. Now and yeah. you're stopped for a long time. And so now how do we make sure that we're getting things, you know, like that 75th Street overpass project, you know, like some of the underpasses and overpasses? How do you make sure that emergency vehicles can still get through if there's a train going through that's going to take 10 minutes? Um, and, you know, I don't think there's any South Sider who hasn't been stuck too long behind a train. But that just takes investments in, in tunnels and underpass, you know, all those rail grade separations. <laughs> I know. I mean, and it's a lot. And you sit there and you talk about it like you use, you know, you give those big numbers and then you sit there and think to yourself, how much would it really cost to be able to implement something like that in a, in a dense area like Evergreen? You need a lot more money and it'd be a pretty big project. So And, if, a, lot of, and a lot of eminent domain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> money alone may not be sufficient. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the post office too, because now that's, that's, that to me is really interesting. Evergreen Park gets a lot of complaints about their post office. Uh, but then every time I bring it up, somebody will be like, yeah, but that Mount Greenwood one. Like everybody's mad about all the post office, I think. I think there's problems at all of them. And I wonder whether or not it's because in this era, there's far less mail actually being sent. Like nobody writes letters to each other anymore, right? Like when I was a kid, like I sat down and I actually learned at St. Dennis uh, Grammar School, like this is how you this is how you write a letter, this is how you address a letter, this is how you send things to somebody. Now most of it's being used for shipping. You got private companies like UPS and, and and FedEx and everybody doing all this massive shipping. You would think it'd be easier on the post office. So is the problem that the post office isn't getting used as much and therefore it's a staffing issue? What do you see as the problem when people see things like really weird things where we have to bring in uh, you know, postal employees from other areas, they have to, during surge times, they need to, they need to, they're, they're actually offering money. I want to say about a year or so ago, where somebody would come in and live in Chicago just so they could actually help hand out things in certain areas. Is it a staffing thing because the post office doesn't get used the same way or is it something else? Um, <clears throat> so in, I think in 2021, we looked at all, all of our calls to the office and 50% of all the calls that came in were about postal delays. Um, so <laughs> suffice it's to a say, thing. yes, it's, it's a, a thing. thing and not yeah. just Evergreen Park, not just about Greenwood, you know, all over. And, and it, it's also, it's really nationwide. So we started digging into it. The first is that the, in terms of volume, the post office is actually as busy as they've ever been. Yes, you stopped writing letters, but you started sending a lots of weird size packages. You know, people who I want to get a pair of shoes and why buy just one pair of shoes? Let me buy 10 pairs and return the nine I don't like, right? All the internet shopping online and everything that that did. And even when you're, even if you're getting that with UPS or FedEx, a lot of those use the post office for the last mile um, because the post office is set up and has that infrastructure. But that's hugely changed the logistics of what the post office has to do because it's one thing to have a sorting facility that's getting mostly, you know, things the size of letter-shaped envelopes um, that can quickly be sorted. Something else when there's a bike box, there's a shoe box, there's, you know, something fragile this end up, there's a refrigerator, you know, and then there's some other mail and how they sort that all through. We had a, uh, we pulled together a, a field hearing with Senator Durbin in downtown Chicago. And the only positive thing I can say about that field hearing is we we had a survey of the post office standards around the country and Baltimore's worse. Um, Chicago. Yeah, not, that's right. We're not the <laughs> worst. That's what we're hanging our head on. <laughs> my, my personal, I, I can't totally prove this, but I, I put a lot of this on, on Louis DeJoy um, that when he came in, he's, he's, he's got some conflicts of interest. He, you know, he's, you know, has a lot of economic commitments to a, to a private logistics firm. But when he came in, he he started shuffling around a lot of the responsibilities. And so when you talk to the postal workers, these people are working long hours, right? Um, and he was saying, well, you don't have you don't have resources, so we're going to have to cut cut delivery times. We're not going to hire people as much. We're going to limit the time at the processing center. And you know, as we need to keep reminding people, it's not called the U.S. Postal Business. It's called the U.S. Postal Service, right? And we got to make sure it delivers. We fixed part of that in the last Congress. There was this weird accounting thing that the post office, uniquely among federal agencies, was required to set aside all money for all of their long-term pensions before they could free up any cash. 
you know, it'd be like you saying, I'm not going to pay my rent until I've covered my retirement. Right. Right. And it was just an accounting problem. They had cash there. And so we, so we passed a bill. We got that law changed to free up some cash. The post office could spend it. There still have been issues with the Postal Service shutting down some of the processing facilities. And so, you know, part of the reason why you'll see, boy, this neighborhood seems fine. This neighborhood is not so good. In some cases, it's because they've shut down a processing facility that was serving that area. And so now the letter carrier who used to <clears throat> have a 15 minute drive to the processing center from his house and then would go do his route and come back home or her route now has to drive an hour to the processing center because that's not there. They're still working the same. So now you've got mail piling up, right? The, the, the Postal Service is an independent agency. <clears throat> and so until the, it's, it's at the discretion of the Postal Board of Governors whether to fire DeJoy, retain DeJoy, put him on a workout plan, whatever they want to do. And that Board of Governors has been understaffed for a long time. So a lot of what we've pushed has just been saying, get that board fully staffed. Um, they currently have, I believe, seven of the nine slots filled. Um, Biden just um, <clears throat> nominated Marty Walsh, the former Secretary of Labor, a uh, good Boston guy with a good thick Boston accent, who I think is actually also, I think he's like a commissioner of the NHL right now. If I okay. <laughs> really, really nice guy. They've just nominated him to be on that board. There's still one more slot the Senate has to confirm. Not going to be my call whether or not DeJoy stays, but I think there's an accountability there. That if you're the if you're the head of an organization, and the organization is seeing declining service standards, you got to have some accountability. You know, I've been thinking the word accountability for the last three minutes while you've been talking because I think that it's not only even at that level, but even all the way down. Because and that's how it is in any business, right? If there's not accountability up high, then there's no accountability down low. I mean, perfect example in Evergreen, and I laugh about it with Frank Murray, who's the library director. He'll send out every quarter like a mailer that has all the library programs. And the joke that we have is that he'll come over here to record his once a month thing on the EP podcast. And he'll be like, did you get the mailer? And I'll either say no, or I'll tell him I got 20 of them because somebody's like, I just got to get rid of these things and just shoves them all into. And and then I know they complain, but like, that's the thing. It's there's got to be somewhere in there where there's structure in any business. You see that anytime you see something failing is because from the top on down, nobody's turned around and saying, you got to do your job or you're out. Nobody, there's no accountability. And I think that that, that's probably the number one thing. It's the problem with the White Sox right now, Sean. There's no accountability. Jerry yeah. Reinsdorf is just sitting up there saying, I want to win, and they just never win. He doesn't spend any money. He doesn't He doesn't hire the right people. It's an accountability thing, I would think. Well, maybe the analogy would be like, I'd, you know, I'd rather blame Reinsdorf than blame the second baseman. Right. Right. Yeah. The, <clears throat> certainly my experience is that, like, the letter carriers, the folks who work in the offices are good people, but... If you had to if you had to drive twice as far to get the mail, if all of a sudden the you know the sorting machine that you needed to get an upgrade because it's handling different size materials isn't getting a budget for an upgrade, these are the folks on the front lines who you're going to blame. But my experience with the actual rank and file folks is they're doing the best they can with what they've got, but we need to get them more resources to make sure that they can do their job. And it in a you know pretty dynamic and changing changing mail delivery system. How quick would that happen? I mean, you said you have two board things. This might, this guy might need to be removed. Like how, how quick does that happen? Cause I think that's the thing. I think all anybody on, when I talk to locally, anytime you hear somebody complain about anything, everybody just goes, well, it just moves so slow, right? Well, like everything seems, I know it's a big machine, right? And you're, you're, you're in there doing what you can for your constituents in, on a federal level, right? But you must get there and be like, wow, this is crazy. I have so many congressmen in so many different areas. Everybody's got a different idea. And by the time you convince everybody that you want to move in a direction, an election happens, you got to re, you got to, you got to start convincing new people and moving things and getting things done seems to take a long time. Well, I guess democracy is slow and messy, but the, the independent agencies shouldn't necessarily be slow and messy, right? I mean, I don't think people were complaining about the post office four years ago. Um, and, you know, to be clear, I think it's much easier to break things than to build them. Um, and a lot of what we've been doing while DeJoy's in there is just saying, like, no, let's let's up the pressure. So we just did a we just did a press conference with a bunch of members of the Illinois delegation a couple of weeks ago outside a building where DeJoy was speaking. It was, you know, a little bit revolutionary, I suppose. But we wanted we knew he'd be there and we knew the cameras would be there to say you cannot shut down these sorting facilities um, because if you shut them down, it'll take a long time to rebuild them, right? So, and thankfully, we got a couple of them stopped. I know he's still talking about shutting down, one down in, uh, I want to say Springfield, 
It's not one close to here, but there still is some talk about other Illinois sorting facilities coming down. But as long as we keep them from breaking things, then I think getting I think getting good leadership in can can move pretty quickly. Sean Caston is uh, your U.S. congressman, and uh, he's he covers a big, large area. Uh, but Evergreen Park is in the middle of it, and we were fortunate enough that he stopped by and and hung out in a basement. I, I appreciate that. What a, what a journey! Born in born in Ireland, lived on the East Coast, comes here, congressman, and now he ended up in my basement. Kind of a low yeah, point. Well, kind of, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you know the uh, all of it was so that I could end up here. There you <laughs> go. It was all you were always on a path, Sean. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Building relationships, supporting the community, and service. These are the things that Country Financial stands for. They're more than just an office you may pass by as you drive through Evergreen Park. They're neighbors who lend a helping hand and support the fabric of your community, including charitable organizations, sports, financial education, and civic organizations. And since Country is already your neighbor, they want to get together and chat. Call your local Country Financial representative, Mike Thauer, today at 708 425 1559 to talk about the things that are important to you and how he can help you protect them. It's now time for your EP podcast, Word on the Street, brought to you by Spoken Vine Wine Bar and Bottle Shop, northeast corner of 95th and Kedzie. I was just in there this weekend. That is a spot here in the EP. Started with a Spanish wine, moved on to a French. Strangely, the Italian never got to the Italian wines, and there's plenty of them. Whatever your taste, if you want to sample or get the big glass and try out all of the wonderful food that they have, it is a 21 and over establishment even to walk in the door, adults only. And if you find something you like at the end of the night, just go to the bottle shop and bring it home with you. See more at SpokenVineWines.com. We talked about the 11th annual senior health fair being put on by OSF Little Company of Mary and the Evergreen Park Fire Department. It is this Wednesday, June the 12th, 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. Doctors and nurses from Little Company of Mary Medical Center healthy, fun activities, light refreshments. It's a free event open to community seniors and their caregivers. The Village of Evergreen Park is also throwing in a shredding event 10 a.m. until noon right there at Yukich Field, 8900 South Kedzie. Also at Yukich, never forget, Thursdays 8 a.m. until 1 p.m. each and every Thursday is the Farmer's Market. And you can still become an entrant in the Independence Day Parade that kicks off from 95th and Springfield at 6.30 in the evening on June the 28th with fireworks to follow at Duffy Park. Get over to the Village website to apply to be part of the parade. Meanwhile, the Evergreen Park Public Library has already kicked off their sweet summer reading program. It is not too late to get in there, participate all ages. There's prizes at every level from child to adult. And this Thursday, the 13th of June at 6 p.m., it's book versus movie, cloudy with a chance of meatballs. Grades up to grade five, get in there, watch the movie, and then there'll be a brief discussion of book versus movie. See more at evergreenparklibrary.org. This group sitting down here, bellied up to the bar. I got three gentlemen here, and that's what I love when we have a guest or a group of guests that are like, let's record this in the evening. And uh, they come over with a case. These are these are my favorite guests. Just a hint to everybody else that comes over to be on the show. Uh, for Most Holy Redeemer, I have Terry Goggin. I have Chris Brett. And then I have the pastor of Most Holy Redeemer, James Highland. How are you? Good. Great. You guys are throwing a parking lot party for the second year in a row. Now, I remember last year... You moved away from the carnival because there were security concerns, and it, and it was like, okay, we're going to try this party. And I think at the time, everybody was like, well, we'll see how this works. But it was a big success, from what I understand, last year, right? That's correct. It was a huge success. Yep. Everybody did ver- had a good time, and then we did very well financially last year too. That's and that's the important thing. I remember you telling me at one point, Father, that the carnival was a huge part of your yearly budget like you needed when it rained on on a four or five day carnival it had an impact 
on how the whole year was going to go, right? So, I mean, well, getting having a parking lot party and being able to raise funds for the for the church and for the school, uh, that probably was a daunting task last year. So it was probably a really exciting to see it take off the way that it did. It was. I mean, uh, the carnival, it, it was always our biggest fundraiser for the parish. And if we had a day, you know, it rained a couple days, it, it hurt the bottom line on that. And ultimately, you know, it made things a little bit more difficult for us for the year. Uh, last year, I really didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, I had a goal in mind that I would have been happy if we made, and we made way beyond my goal. There you go. So, now, I think I, I'm going to say, you know, last year, I think we had uh, a lot of people just felt bad that we canceled the carnival. And I think we had a lot of uh, donations people gave, and some of it was sympathy money, I think. Uh, so I don't, know if, I don't know if we expect to have that this year, but I am hoping we'll have a good event again. And, you know, financially, hopefully we do well, but... I also believe it's really important that the people of the parish get to come together and have a good time with each other and maybe see people you haven't seen in a while. You have you have some of the better party planners in the area sitting here. I mean, Terry's been running the barbecue bash as one of the guys behind that, which is always a huge event in Evergreen Park. You know, you could you know when it's barbecue bash weekend because you wake up on a Saturday morning and there's the smell of meat throughout the entire Southwest Quadrant. It's a beautiful thing. It is, right? And they got the big tent and they bring out the bands and all the cooks are there the whole time and that thing is a blast. So being able to put something together in in the parking lot here for you must have been okay, I, I kind of know the basics here of putting this thing together, right? I know where to go find the bands. I, I know where to get the tent from. And I kind of know how we're going to set this up so it's a good event and it's not like a hodgepodge, right? Sure, absolutely. It, it was kind of like a challenge accepted. And it wasn't me alone or even Chris alone accepting that challenge last year and this year. We have a lot of great guys in the parish that belong to different clubs and some that don't. You know, and are just here to help the parish guys like Pat Ostry and Dan Roach and Jack Winters and Tim Ziesmer, who aren't here today, but have been instrumental in, in the success from last year and carrying over into the organization for this year. I'd be remiss. We have another great last year. We had the Ron Burgundies play for us. Uh, kind of Such a, a fun band. Fun band. They, are a, rock fun, band. they are a fun band. This year we're taking on um, Run Forest Run, which is a big Chicagoland 90s cover band. See, so. and I had heard of them before I saw you announce it. And then I kind of looked them up. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to tell you something. First of all, 90s music. I laugh at my kids the other day. I was sitting there. I got two teenagers, right? I got the 18-year-old and the 16-year-old. And I'm like, back when I was your age, we were not listening to music on popular radio from the early 1960s. This 90s thing, these kids are still into it, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's crazy to me, but they like some of their favorite bands are, and, and their favorite albums from those bands sure. are back when we were young, which Absolutely. is crazy to me when I see it. So, I, I mean, that's a pretty good band to come bringing in because 90s music has really become kind of a wheelhouse for parties and for events. Yeah, we're really excited to have them. Uh, they've got a, a good following on, in their own right. So, hopefully, we'll bring a few of their. You know, fans with uh, with them to come down on Saturday the 15th. I think last year we had close to 400, 450 people show up, so we're hoping to get something similar. It's a great opportunity. Forget the fundraising aspect of it. Like the barbecue bash, it's a roll-your-own cooler up, so you can't complain on what there is to drink. Right. Because you bring what you want to bring. You like the hard stuff. Bring the hard stuff. 100%. Yeah. And so uh, hopefully it's just a great, you know, one of the things that's great about the bash is it's just a fun start-of-the-year party. For everyone, you know, if you tie it to the school year. And so hopefully this will be a great, another great end of the year party for everybody at the school and the parish to come over and have a blast. Chris, when you guys are thinking about this thing and you come and you decide to call a parking lot party, was there a temptation to call it like the Redeemer Summer Concert Series or something like that? Because it really is a concert, right? I mean, it's a chance for the community to get together. But in reality, the last couple of years, it's been an outdoor summer concert where you can bring your own right? You bring up your cooler, you guys sell whole tables so you can buy an individual ticket or you could set up a table for your friends and have like an area where you're all set up and you're watching a concert and kind of enjoying the music and dancing and all that other stuff, right? Well, yeah, exactly. You know, we originally, Father Highland wanted to uh, have us call it the Father Highland Bash, but no. we were, we were, is that right? We were afraid. Yeah, absolutely that, not. <laughs> we were afraid we weren't going to get the crowd if unless we just called it a, a party in the parking lot. So <laughs> the gym jam. So, right. Nobody yeah, the come. gym jam. I yeah, like the gym jam. Yeah, the gym jam. Yeah, the gym jam. My party. That's but good. yeah, it was. I mean, it really was. Uh, it, it truly, you know, when we did, we decided that with the, you know, the carnival last year, there, you know, there were a couple people who just said, "Well, we got a tent. We have got a band. 
let's have a party. And we said, we might as well do it to, to you know, just try to race whatever we can. And, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, like he said, with Jack and Pat and, and Terry, I mean, they just, hey, they had some real good fundraising, you know, raffle stuff. We got some nice prizes. We have some more this year. And uh, it, it, it truly was, it was great. And I, you know, we're trying to encourage all the, you know, the younger uh, families that are in Most Holy Redeemer to come on up and, you know, introduce yourself to some of these, these uh, you know, the, the, the parents and stuff the that you're going to start seeing and, and your neighbors and stuff like that. Because the way these things are going to be successful is if we get that younger uh, crowd in and get them more involved, you know, get them, get them involved and in, in helping out. And I think this is a good way to get introduced to it. That is a key, right, Father? Because like, I, I talk to booster clubs for all the different schools around here from time to time. Okay. Some of the public schools in district 124 have been on the show before. Uh, I've talked with people who are, who are doing things for Evergreen Park High School, people that are doing things for martyrs even at, at, at times. And, and I talk with you guys. I always feel like Redeemer's got like multiple booster clubs. Like you have several different groups that work really hard to try to make things run well there and be able to raise funds for for the church. But it also seems like it's a lot of hands doing the work. It's not four or five people. Like you guys mentioned a couple of names and I guarantee you, Terry and Chris are sitting there going, we really should have mentioned so-and-so because there's so many people that get involved over there and you're talking about the idea of now we got to make sure the next generation of parents get in there. Is that the key to success, especially for like a a private school on the South side of Chicago these days? The more involvement you can get from people, the better off it is. Uh, And my dad always used to say, many hands make light work. And you know, the more people you have, uh, the more you can do, the easier it is for people. Give me the details on this, because I know we kind of skirted around a little bit in the interview. Uh, the date is June the 15th. June the 15th. There is a live band that's going to be out there. Yes. Uh, you do have a tent, if I'm not mistaken, so yes. it's going to be rain or shine. There is an ability for people to buy an entire table or just come uh, on their own. It's BYOB or whatever libation you want to bring along to the party. Uh, give me the start time, end time, how they get tickets. So they can get tickets uh, uh, actually through the website. So if they go on to the parish uh, website, they can, there's a link there to buy tickets online. If they're looking for a table, um, they can certainly just call the rectory, ask for Eileen Brett. She will take care of that if it's a table or individual se- seats. We also have uh, the, the grand raffle, the, the raffle that traditionally was at the carnival. We're going to do again this year. That's big money, right? How much so, is that? So the, on Saturday night, we're going to pull three car- three names the uh, ten thousand dollar winner, wow, thirty five hundred dollars, and then fifteen hundred. Oh, All right. So there's three winners. This ten thousand, thirty five hundred, and fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred for this. So on those, okay. And then we also, I'm buying a ticket. If you're buying, I'm a buying ticket. more than one ticket. How much is a ticket? The tickets for the to get in are thirty dollars each. Okay. The tickets for the raffle are fifty dollars each, or three for a hundred. Okay. Well, the three for hundred makes a lot more, a lot of sense, right? I mean, like, I'm, I, I'm I'm no whiz at math, but it's like getting a free ticket if you're buying two, right? That's kind of how hundred percent, yeah, exactly. All right, cool. And then, uh, the, the, so they can go on the website also, and there's a link there to Run Force Run. So if they want to check out the band, they can check it out. They've got videos. What website the are they going to? They go to uh, mostlyreber.org. Okay, and there's there's and you can buy the tickets there. there. You can there's a link to buy the tickets there, or you can stop into the directory. Is there any difference to buying them in advance or showing up at the door? Nope. Just if you have a table, there'll be a table reserved for you. Now, with the tables, too, we've got 40 tables ready to go with 10 chairs each, you know, so we're hoping to accommodate 400 people to the place. I think we're setting aside the first 30 for reservations, and then we'll open up more as need be, if need be. One of the things if the I'm guys, a single, if I'm if I'm coming single, because if I show up, I'm coming single because this Correct. is 21 and over, right? Correct. I can't bring the kids nope, to this one, right? Over. So if this is 21 over. I'm coming to this thing, and I'm newly single, so I'm coming by myself. So will you find me a group of people to hang out with? If I like, it, let's say I'm listening to this right now, and I'm like, I like to party, I like bands, I don't know a lot of people over there. Are those people going to be okay? Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. It's okay. a very, it's always a very welcoming crowd. Uh, even back when it was the carnival and just the beer tent back there during the carnival days. So the, I'll have a table. Chris will have a table. There'll be plenty of guys to point out and send you in the directions. You can hang out with me, Chris. Can I hang out with you? Yeah, you can hang out with me. Table. Right. Awesome. Yeah, Chris, because uh, you're, you're going to know anybody there when you show up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> One challenge I'll throw out there for the listeners that are hearing about this for the first time and are kind of on the fence because maybe they won't know a lot of people. We are having a, what we call a block party challenge where we're trying to, to get fr- you know friends and rel- uh, uh, neighbors that live on the same block 
to maybe rent a table together. And we'll, if, if they do and they say, hey, we're at 98th and Turner, we'll put a sign up on the table for that team. Oh. And then the block that might oh, get the most, yeah. the block that gets the, the most tables will win a prize. They'll be dis, uh, disclosed the night of. And so far, the 97th and Hamlin block has two tables. Two that are tables the already over there. Yeah. So if you got a half a dozen people that live on the same block and they're all thinking, maybe I'll do this, but I might not know anybody, get them all together, re- uh, reserve a table, give us your coordinates, and we'll have a sign for you. And All right. So it's, it's a party and a competition amongst <laughs> neighborhood blocks. Absolutely. That's awesome. Right. I love it. I love it. Friendly, love for it. sure friendly. Very cool. All right. MostHolyRedeemer.org. Get all the details. See the band. Get out there on June the 15th. Father looks like he wants to tell me something. Are you just thirsty? You want another no, beer or what? Just, um, just wanted to say, you know, want to check out the band preview online. If you like the Spice Girls and Hanson, you will love Run Forest Run. So, <laughs> really? Really. That's his firsthand experience of wow. seeing the website. Really? Okay. Wow. I I'm did sure not Blink see that coming. And stuff too, Blink but the, the videos that they have up are, you uh, know, it's all 90s. It's not just Hanson. And thanks a okay, lot, Father. Good. Good. I was worried for yeah, a second. No, I was just going to watch just Umbop, Umbop over and yeah, over again. No, yeah. no, no. That's just on Father's mixtape. It took no. me two years to figure out the one in the middle was a boy. <laughs> I thought it was a girl. <laughs> it's the EP Podcast. All things Evergreen Park. It's the EP Podcast. Evergreen Park. <laughs>